The ancient witness for today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 31. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucify him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. That was a good reading. Uh, one of the things I've noticed about these, and you maybe you have too, about these post-resurrection Jesus stories is how he keeps showing up seemingly out of nowhere and then disappears again. You can remember, it was just a couple weeks ago, Easter, the story of the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene is despairing at the empty tomb only to have Jesus suddenly appear to her. At first she thinks, of course, he's the gardener, but then he speaks her name and she sees Jesus. Thomas, last week we heard, refused to believe until he sees Jesus in the flesh and seemingly the next week out of nowhere, Jesus shows up and reveals himself in the flesh to Thomas. The disciples are all together in the locked room in this Easter post-resurrection Easter story, and they are afraid to go out, and they are asking themselves what next. And again, Jesus shows up. He walks through locked doors. Later, Jesus just shows up on the lake shore while they are fishing, going back about their business. And they sit and eat together. Now we have this story, one of my favorites of the post-resurrection accounts, where Jesus again shows up out of nowhere as these two forlorn companions, one is named Cleopas, 
are walking home trying to figure or out or make sense of their disappointment and the strange stories they've heard of the empty tomb. It seems like Jesus ke just keeps showing up. This is one of the questions occasion occasionally asked at church gatherings uh, that I've been to is like, or, or workshops or so, so forth. It's like, where is Jesus showing up for you? I know I'm supposed to have an answer to that when I'm, when I'm in these groups, but I honestly sometimes uh, come up dry in answering that. Is it my fault? And I'm just not noticing, or am I like Cleopas and his companion? I ju I'm just too caught up in my own ego, my own distractions, my own worries, my own thoughts to notice and to be open to the presence of Jesus. What I like about this story is that it provides a kind of pattern for me or a blueprint for how the community of faith can live. For the more liturgical churches, like such as Catholics and Lutherans and Episcopalians who celebrate communion every Sunday, there is a four-part formula that reflect in this story that reflects their worship. There's the gathering, and that in the story is the two companions on the road. There is the word, that is the, the, uh, the uh, reading of the scriptures and the, the commentary on it. That, and that is seen in Jesus discussing scriptures with the, these two companions on the road. Then there is communion or Eucharist. And that's seen in this story where Jesus is being revealed in the breaking of the bread and of table fellowship. And then the sending and the mission. All churches send out the congregation to go therefore and live the gospel. And that's the part where they go in the story where they go out and they tell the good news that Christ is alive. Since UCC and Mennonites also, of which I, I gravitate in most circles with, are not as liturgically patterned as some denominations, I still find this story helpful as a model for what faith community centered around Christ should and can look like. Um, the overall dominant theme for me in this story is that is, it is a story, the word comes to mind, journey. To me, that one word, journey, captures the life of faith of the community of what we call church. You know, we, we have that one hymn that I love, and you probably do too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. We are here to love each other. Walk the mile and carry the load. It's reflective to me of this story we're thinking about this morning. Like Clampus and his friend, we are just trying to make sense of things that happen around us in our lives. Which is really tough when we're going it alone. Nobody to go with us. But when we are with companions and friends, the load seems lighter. There is hope. We are not alone. Christ seems to show up when we walk the faith, the path of faith and of life itself with others. What a failure and how wrong it is for people to be in, ch in church, as we are this morning, where still they feel alone, as in deeply unseen and unknown in their struggles, and fragility and humanity, which is what we all share. The hardest loneliness to bear is when one is in the company of others and yet feels unseen, like a ghost. 
Nothing feels lonelier than to be in the company of seemingly together people, which we know we are not. Nobody is all that together. While inside, we think, we feel like we are falling apart, but nobody seems to want to know that part of us. Pastors can feel that way, and certainly attenders of the church, all of us can too. And that's part of the problem. We have to be more than mere, quote, attenders of church. We have to understand ourselves, as the song says, as pilgrims together on a journey, fellow travelers on the road, because this life is, yes, beautiful, but it's also hard, and we know that. Like Cleophas and his friends, as life happens to us and around us, it can be chaotic and confusing and complex and disappointing at times. As it says in this scripture, the phrase Cleophas says to this stranger who is Jesus, we had hoped. We had hoped. And packed into that three-word phrase is a lot of disappointment. In disempowerment of that phrase, we had hoped. It's brokenness, it's disappointment. And that's we all carry some of that. We had hoped. I had hoped. We had hoped. I had hoped. My family had hoped that the results of the test would come back negative. We had hoped that this time our loved one wouldn't have relapsed into addiction. We had hoped that our family wouldn't have broken up. We had hoped this time. In their despair, in this story, as they walk, sharing, talking, praying, crying, laughing, talking story. Here. It's a beautiful story that way to me. Jesus shows up in the journey in companionship of shared life. But wait, there's more. Jesus says, he opened their eyes to the revelation of Scripture. And we all know Scripture is a puzzling thing to figure out. Uh, Spend a little time in prayer or silence uh, and invite the spirit and presence of Christ, of God, before reading. Text of the community. You notice it's the three companions walking together on the Emmaus Road. It is what I've you thrown this word out. It's the group hermeneutic. It's the understanding in, of Scripture in conversation together. Not just us, but what people have said throughout the, the, the centuries, too. Finally, they come to Cleophas' house. They practically beg Jesus to stay with them. They insist. And Jesus plays it coy here, but reluctantly he agrees to stay. They ask him to do the honors of blessing the food. Just as he breaks bread and gives thanks, lo and behold, their eyes are open. Jesus is revealed. And then just as fast as he reveals, he's gone. He's not there. Then he's there. Then he's not there. But were not our hearts burning with us, within us, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? That's the, the following, that's verse 32, that uh, we ended with verse 30, 31. But that was their response when Jesus disappears. It's in hindsight that they understood it was the presence of Christ. That's how it works. 
It's in the looking back oftentimes that we see things differently. It's true for me, at least, I don't see things so well while I'm in the thick of it. It's often after the fact, maybe years after the fact, that I can see the situation with much greater clarity. I see the learnings, I see the blessings, I see the growth, I see the healing. I see these things after the fact. One can perhaps frame it like this story suggests. The holy presence of the risen one is with us on the journey, even if we fail to recognize it at the time. When it comes to um, books and movies related to this topic I'm raising, and storytelling in general, I have, personally, I have two favorite genres. I'll call the first one the road trip genre, uh, and I'll call the second one the dysfunctional family genre. Now, dysfunctional family, by the way, is pretty much every family to various degrees. I think we can recognize that. Tonight, this is a little plug for the movie, tonight, incidentally, we'll be showing the movie Smoke Signals, uh, which captures both of these genres nicely. Um, these two companions in the, in the film are Thomas and Victor, and they take a road trip. And in the journey together, they learn some things about the family's pain and the family's trauma and the family's dysfunction that could only be learned by taking the journey. It's an Emmaus Road story in many respects. We all have Emmaus Road story journeys and stories. It is the paradigm, I think, of what the church is supposed to be, a community of beautiful, confused, complex, broken people walking a journey together and trying to make sense of what may be or seems to be nonsense. We are together alone, paradoxically, also alone together. And yet, we should not feel lonely in our presence because we are not taking this journey alone. We are a community. We have companions. And we say in the church, in some mysterious way, the presence of the risen Christ is with us. Where two or more are gathered, as Jesus said, I am there. Church, we could say, is on one level a kind of support group as all communities should be, but a support group that understands that the spirit of the risen one walks beside, not just sometimes, but always. We just don't notice it, but it is present nonetheless. I say this, of course, as a matter of faith, not a subject of empirical truth, but faith and a conviction that, for me at least, is true. I just forgot, I just forget that truth, and I don't always sense it. Now, I use the word support group, but that word seems a little clinical to me. A better word might perhaps be community, but an open community, not a closed one, a place where others are invited in and made to feel welcome, a place where people can feel like and know they are safe, they belong, that others welcome them, and that, and this is the hard part for us, we allow ourselves to be known in return. To be known requires time and presence and a willingness to be vulnerable. You will recall from our reading from the gospel last week, as I said, Jesus appears to Thomas, and he still has his wounds even in the resurrection. That too is a clue for us. That's the Christ who walks among us, the one who has been raised and yet still carries the marks of pain and suffering and trauma, even in resurrection. The son of humanity, or the son of man, as sometimes referred, Jesus referred to himself, that is the wounded one. But we also say the Son of God. 
and that is the risen one. The one who is, this is who Christ is. This is who we are. This is the community we call the church. Our prayer should be that it be so authentically by the power of the Spirit that we may, in fact, be the body of Christ, both wounded and risen together.